I hope it's first. Hello, everyone, and welcome to my genealogy live interview. I've had to rebrand it now. Uh, this is my first one on my Facebook page, so hopefully this will go. So, but, uh, so I'm going to give this a go for one or two episodes and see how I'm uh, If I get a good audience over here, I'll keep doing it here. Uh, and then eventually post it on Instagram afterwards. So, without further ado, I shall bring my guest on. She is an Irish genealogist and is involved uh, in the IGRS and uh, has been one of the people that uh, likes mentoring quite a bit recently. <laughs> uh, Claire Bradley. And Hello. CB genealogy. Hello, Claire. Oh, I can't hear you. No, uh, this is going great. Okay, well, I can see you and you're moving. So, uh, no, I can, I can hear good. you now. It's okay. <laughs> Fine, as long as that works, I don't mind. Right, I thought I had this here. Uh, so, uh, I, no, I have no idea if anyone's actually shown up yet. Um, oh, wait, sorry, I just saw we had two viewers. Hooray, three viewers. Hooray. So, anyway. <laughs> I, I'm just trying to get a signal of where everything is now. So um, I, while I'm working this out, Claire, why don't you introduce yourself? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's great to be here for a start. Uh, so what else would you be doing on a Saturday night at the moment, <laughs> except chatting about genealogy? That, in fact, is is would be likely even if there wasn't a pandemic for me, uh, I have to say. So it's uh, no different, really. Um, I, where will I start? Um, I've been working in the genealogy field professionally for about 10 years, but I was a very enthusiastic hobbyist before that. Um, and in fact, I started when I was younger than, than you are now, Daniel. I started when I was 12. Um, because, uh, yeah, and there's a surprising number of genealogists out there who, who started um, when they were 12 specifically. I don't know what it is about 12, but... In my case, it was because I was given a project by a history teacher, what the whole class was. I think it was just something that was in the school book, in fact. I don't think she came up with it on her own. And um, so we had to go and have a look at our family tree. And we weren't to do it with any records. It was just orally done by speaking to people in the family. And my, my grandparents lived on the same road. I had three of them alive at that point. And uh, so I was dropped over to Granny Bradley for the morning. And she spent some time telling me about her family and then about her her husband's family, which she knew quite a lot about, considering that, you know, she hadn't very, met very many of them and he was dead. Um, and then I walked down the road um, and spent the afternoon with my mother's parents, um, which was mostly my, my grandmother again, telling me about things uh, about her own side and her husband's side with very little input from him. I have to say he was probably just sitting there watching cricket and um, making the occasional comment. And so put together a little project based on that. It was all just sort of direct ancestors at that stage and um, pleased with that. And I put it away until I was in my um, early, well, probably when I was in college. Um, so 19, 20, something like that. And I, I took a look at it again. I thought there must be more I can do with this. And I started to consider it more seriously at that point. And there wasn't anything on the internet. It did exist at that stage, but there wasn't anything on it that was of use for Irish records at that point. So I started with going into the births, deaths and marriage office and um, the National Archives to look at the census, which was, was not yet online. It was all on microfilm at that point. And you had to know where somebody was to find them on the census already. So quite a challenge if you if you just knew that your ancestors came from Dublin like mm. three or like four grandparents did um so uh had a bit of success there a bit of success in the birth deaths and marriages office and I kind of worked on a piecemeal over the next few years used to ring my mother's mother at the end of a day I'd go into the Pier Street library because they had the microfilms for the birth deaths and marriage records so it meant that you could go in on a Saturday um you know, because the birth, death and marriage office wasn't open on Saturday, still isn't, and uh, do the sort of the index work on microfilms. And then uh, on Monday, 
or a Tuesday, I would I would ask my mother to go into the uh, birth sets and marriages office on her lunch break while she was at work to um you were really yeah. dedicated, clearly. Yeah, well, well, thanks to her courier service as well, you know. But she worked in Irish Life, and at the time, the GRO was in the Irish Life complex, so it was actually quite near to her to go in and get them. And uh, so I would work away. And she was interested too, so that helped. Um, and so at that point, I decided, you know, I'd really like to be doing this as a career, and uh, how would I go about that? And I wanted to have some sort of qualification to back up how you know I said if, I, if people are going to pay me money to do this work I'd like to have some proof that I know what I'm talking about and not just that I've successfully traced some of my own ancestors so I looked around and I did what a course that doesn't exist anymore in UCD University College Dublin part-time over three years at night and um, to get a certificate in in family history which was run a course run by Sean Murphy who is still a practicing genealogist but he's retired from teaching now and a lot of people in Dublin would have done his course over the last, he, he taught it for nearly 30 years. So a lot of people have done his, his course successfully. And uh, so at the end of that, then that was 2011, I set up shop doing, uh, I, I still have another job. I should point out, this isn't a, genealogy isn't a field where you can usually earn enough money to live um, mm. successfully. So I do have another job and then I do this on the side as well, um, working for, uh, paying clients and I also do a lot of sort of pro bono helping people out on forums and things like that and ancestry hour and so on yeah and, uh, and that's where I've primarily seen you most of the time and you know any anytime flicking through my timeline and mm. uh, I'd say you were probably one of the first people I met in off Twitter like yes. in real life because I met you and David Ryan yeah, uh, and yeah. at the Back to Our Pass 2019. So mm. that was kind of our first encounter pre COVID. Yeah. yeah, which of course was our last Back to Our Past in Dublin. There was one in February last year in Belfast, which was really good fun. I was at it. That was the last time I was out of the country. <laughs> I was in Belfast in February last year uh, at Back to Our Past. And, uh, but it's a much smaller event up there um, than mm. the Dublin one. And uh, hopefully, it'll be, hopefully, we'll be able to have one next October or well, we'll see yeah yeah well hopefully we can uh, get get out soon <laughs> that's all we can hope yeah. uh, so I, I was gonna actually ask you this but you kind of answered it was kind of how did you get into genealogy but obviously yeah. like your grandmother's uh, <laughs> there yeah. there's always a good bit of inspiration and curiosity from them um, yeah, it was lucky because my dad wasn't the slightest bit interested. And in fact, it, you know, anytime I ever told him anything, he'd be like, "Is this story over now? Can I go back to working with adults?" He really wasn't that interested at all. And so, um, it was a good thing that somebody else was interested to to listen to me about talk about. It. Oh yeah, like um, that is something that does help. Like my dad a lot asks if the odd thing, like if there's a, like if there's any anniversaries or something, I'll know him. And he'll just be intrigued. And my mom is kind of the one I've done it most with. Uh, yeah. She she she's quite interested in it, same as me. Uh, so yeah, it's something we like to do uh, together. It's a yeah. nice group activity. Uh, and if I can't do it with my mom, I do it with uh, PJ or Tyler or anyone in the hidden branch. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm permitting. Um, <laughs> well, that's one of the things I like about Ancestry Hour is that there is a real nice community element to it. And, mm. um, you know, someone, you know, if I say, oh, I found this really exciting thing, which might only be that I found a record about someone, you know, yeah. there are other people in the Ancestry Hour community who will be like, yes, I understand the joy of that, you know, <laughs> whereas, whereas trying to tell you're not interested in genealogy, friends or family, they were like, oh, that, that's great for you. Yeah, and, and then they move on. Yeah. So it's nice to have, it's nice to have the community yeah. elements, you know. Yeah, and that is kind of, I, I'd say when I joined Twitter, that was actually the first thing that kind of, it was very odd kind of starting off. And then I'd say, um, you know, Ancestry I was actually kind of where I started to gain traction in the communities, kind of where I actually got to know many of the people that I do now uh, mm -hmm. through that. Uh, 
and it's nice e even though it's like very fast and very speedy it's it's nice because it shows the amount the community that is there within it yeah i'd love to see there be more irish people involved in it though it's, it, it is primarily still a, a uk based event yeah and that, I mean, I think you and I are the main two people who engage with it on a very regular basis in Ireland. And there's, there's a core of maybe, you know, 10 more people who sometimes engage with it. But I'd love to see the, you know, the different societies and the different uh, organizations, you know, even if they're just doing a scheduled tweet during the hour, I think it would be good. Hmm. So obviously you've been doing this for quite a while like you said previously um what resources have you found most so like most helpful in your research well like anything else it, it's it's a combination of everything that is most helpful um i mean i would say that i i started with the census and uh, that's probably the thing that is the best starting point for everybody and um, so because and the, I would say it's the most helpful because nearly everybody can find someone who they are related to quite quickly on the census. Um, so in Ireland, we only have the 1901 and the 1911 censuses available to us. The uh, 19th century censuses were all destroyed through a series of unfortunate events. You just leave it at that. Um, and we don't have the any censuses after 1911 have not been released yet to the public. So, um, so everybody... Um, should know, you know, if you take any person in Ireland at the moment, they should be able to name somebody in their family who was alive in 1911, um, be it a grandparent, a great grandparent. They, you know, that should still be within living memory. So for someone who is just getting started, if you said to them, okay, you're 50 years old, what's the name of your grandparents? Hopefully that we'd find one of them at least on the census quite quickly if they knew the county and a, a rough bit of information. And I, I love that, like, you know, you, you know, you go from I've got nothing to 30 seconds or five minutes later, I have got something concrete that is about my family. Um, and the census is free in Ireland. You don't need to be registered on any websites to use it, um, although you can use it on other websites, which is sometimes helpful because sometimes you can't find something on one site and you search the same thing on another site and you come up with different results. Um, so I, I love that it's it's so versatile as well. If I wanted to find out how many married beekeepers there were in um, Offaly in 1901, we could we could do that with the census. Um, so I love the versatility of the way they've allowed you to search every field. Yeah, and that, and that does help, especially if you kind of think if people do like a one, now I'm going off on a tangent here, but if so like you were saying, oh, I'm doing a one-place study and I don't know, or something and you want to see how many farmers there were how many expensive yeah. ones you could do just the occupation yeah. field and just that would tell you straight away how many yeah. so yeah i do i yeah. do agree with you on the versatility part somebody came into me once in the national library where i do i help out with the the genealogy advisory service in the summertime um and it's mainly tourists to come in but on this occasion, it was a woman and she had very specific knowledge. She said, I know that my ancestor was the butler in Malahide Castle. And I said, no way, I'm from Malahide in the manner of Irish people all over. And then she said, but he's not on the census in Malahide Castle. And I've looked for his name and I can't find it. I said, OK, <laughs> what's going on here? Like, so we pull up the census from Malahide Castle. No, he's not there. And I said, what's his name? And I admit, I can't remember what she told me, but it was something that to me was ripe for being mistranscribed. And uh, I said, okay, we'll search the census for everyone whose occupation is Butler. And it threw up quite a lot of people, but we searched it and then we sorted the by, by the name. And we went through it line by line and we found him. And uh, his name was mistranscribed quite badly. But he was in Donegal, and it turns out that whatever Lord Talbot, whoever, was off visiting somebody in Donegal when the census happened, and the butler had gone with them as you know to to help out in you know some sort of Downton Abbey type way, um, and so he was in Donegal, 
his name was mistranscribed, but we found him because he had an unusual occupation. I mean, you obviously you couldn't do that if someone was a farmer or a blacksmith or something. It had to be something that you could pin down quite specifically. But you know, we, we found him that way, which I loved. Yeah. And, uh, and that's another thing like I, I feel like with the that's one thing I'm not a fan of with the census website is that sometimes you might type it in but you have to so I type it in a certain way because it might give sort of similar spellings you have to no, it doesn't yeah, that's a flaw with the way they designed it, isn't it? Um, and I hope that when when we get a relaunched site, whenever that may be, um, that they will include a sound X function on it. And um, you can put in asterisks, you know, in the space in in instead of a letter, though. So I mean, if you were looking for someone whose surname was Mac and you didn't know whether they spelt it M A C or M C, you could put M asterisk C, and it would return everything that had both of those. In it so right. and and they uh, and that works for any any letters that are missing so you could do m a c m a h asterisk and then you would get mahan and, and and all sorts of other things at the end um but they hide that information quite well on the website too and there's only a very small bit of how to use the website guidance on it and it could really do with being beefed up but uh it mm. hasn't the, the site hasn't changed at all since um since it was launched in 2009 so it, it, it is looking it, it's still working fine but it's looking a little tired i would say <laughs> Fair enough. so um obviously you said that you obviously do work for clients so that's probably one, one of your uh many avenues that you've gone down but are there any projects or ventures that you are currently doing on the side or yeah. doing as well so um, not content with having, you know, two jobs, I decided to take on a master's <laughs> this year. And so I'm, I'm currently doing the, what's called a, a master's in the history of the family in the University of Limerick, which is obviously online at the moment. And uh, um, so I would, I would class this as kind of academic genealogy. So it's it's going into sort of migration studies. It's going into the development of the family structure. Um, it's all based towards Ireland, um, because given the nature of the course being in Ireland. Um, but we do look at other places as well, and we we look at um, the movement of Irish people around the world, and uh, and then so those classes, and then we have to write a dissertation. Um, for the final part of the the course, so it's just one year, and I just thought it would be a we really broaden my knowledge um, of this area, particularly with uh, the diaspora. As often as a as a genealogist, you get people coming to you, and they, you know, they know that their ancestors were Irish, and and that's really all they know, um, mm. or they know a name, but they don't know where in Ireland. And you know, so to be able to help those people better, I thought I need to understand the background of what it's going. And although I had studied at college before, I hadn't studied Irish history at third level. So I felt that that would give an extra depth to my knowledge. So, I mean, uh, what that has resulted in is is increasing my book buying habit immensely. So, you know, I was already someone who probably bought at least one new book every week before I did this course. And then they closed all of the libraries in the country. And I... I can't get any books in the libraries and there's only so many that you can get as ebooks in the college library so um yeah so just today i got two new books and um, that i need for for research purposes and spending a lot of time on ebay and um you know buying things secondhand and so on um and hoping very much that the libraries might reopen next month and we'd be able to get into them i mean it's difficult for for all college students at the moment, and but particularly the, my classmates, and we're trying to decide what primary sources we're going to use for our dissertation work. And primary sources are usually in archives or libraries, so many of us cannot get access to what we what we need uh, the building blocks for this this important academic work. So, yeah, so lots of books being bought, and um, but it's it's really enjoyable. I'm really loving doing it. I mean, I'm still finding time to take on. A little bit of client work and um, not as much so it, it's it's kind of a funny position where i've said okay i'll have to step back from doing the the really in-depth client research this year while i work on this but you know um the oh daniel has gone
I don't know, is he coming back? Just give them a minute and see. Does anyone have any questions while uh, we wait for Daniel to come back? You can type them into the chat. I'm going to see if I can get hold of him. Ah, here we go. Can see the dining room. That's crunchy Wi Fi for you. Hello. You return. Hello. <laughs> yes, I have. What happened here? <laughs> Blame the Wi Fi, and that is what happened. Uh, <laughs> I dread so, to think about it. So, anyway, I can't remember what we were saying exactly, but I was. We were talking about e books in the library. Yes. So, anyway, it, it, the whole the Masters is going really well. It's very intense. Um, and uh, uh, it will be over by the middle of August. So at that point, um, I will be able to take on much more client research again at that stage and, and go back to you know my volunteering roles um, with more effort. And, and hopefully that will tie in nicely with then the autumn and, and maybe society being able to meet in person again and, and, and you know go into record offices and so on. So, um, you were a cl you were obviously very experienced in so like so like your knowledge and your uh, research techniques and skills. But is there something that you learned so like that you know now that you wish you knew when you started? Yeah, I I would say that I wish I had known that people tell you wrong information. <laughs> Um, and that they that they don't necessarily know that it's wrong. It's not malicious, although of course sometimes it might be. But that most of the time, uh, people will tell you a piece of information, and it might have become twisted over time, um, or um, it might have gotten wrong over time, and and they won't necessarily know that it's wrong anymore. Um, and so they pass it on in good faith, and you go looking for it, and you go, like, oh, I did anything to do with that, you know. Um, and of course, people might also be telling you information wrongly on purpose. You know, if there's, you know, uh, and I, I'm thinking of an example here, like say, um, if somebody was um, adopted and uh, a family member didn't didn't want them to know that they were adopted, and that sort of thing happened a lot in Ireland. In the news this week in Ireland, there was a documentary about uh, illegal adoptions that happened um, in the 50s and 60s, and even into the 70s, where children were adopted but their adoptive parents' names were placed on their birth certificate and then they didn't know themselves that they were adopted until adulthood when they were told by mm. state authorities and not always in the most sensitive of ways. So um, that sort of thing can be, uh, you know, misleading as well, of course, and, and there, there's a deliberate attempt to mislead, but I'm talking more about the, the, the genuine, I think that guy came from Donegal and then you find out that he actually came from Cork or something. You know, that you know, people just not not knowing and speculating without telling you that they, they don't actually know, that they're just kind of making it up. So that, mm. you know, so just, I, I would, really what I would distill that down in, into is interrogate every piece of information that you're given and think about um, how do they know that information? Like, you know, if, if I was to say to you, how do you know that your mother is your mother? Yeah. No. Okay. Just, you know, how would you answer that? Yeah, I get, I get what you mean. You know, you you were obviously there when you were born, but you don't have any memory of that. Um, and your birth certificate tells you the name of your mother. 
Um, so that's one piece of official information. Um, and then you could say, but I also know because my mother has told me she is my mother. Um, mm. and so, I mean, that doesn't, that's not less valuable than the piece of paper that records it, but there are different ways of, of interrogating information. And when we go back further in time, we don't have the, uh, the luxury of saying, well, I know because somebody directly told me that information. We have to rely on what paper is left behind. And that might leave out crucial pieces of information or um, or people might not realize that it was important. You know, it was something I found once uh, out and I said it to my grandmother and she said, oh, sure, I knew that. And I said, well, why didn't you tell me? And she said, I didn't think that was important. You know, I it was know. something about some, somebody's occupation or something. She was like, oh, sure, I wouldn't, wouldn't have thought that was important at all. Um, because, you know, n people don't know what might or might not be important. And, you know, genealogy is, is, is like doing the jigsaw with no picture to refer to. You don't know what's going to be important. You don't know, is that a piece of the sky or is that a piece of a very crucial bit of the puzzle? Yeah, and that, that does happen. And let's say if you kind of had, you know, tampering is so like, well, not tampering, but if so like people kind of change some bits, it might leave you kind of pulling your hair out and yeah. expecting, oh, why aren't they there? Why aren't they here with this person? Why didn't this happen when it should have? And yeah, you just get into wishing, mm -hmm. oh, why couldn't everyone just be honest? And But obviously everyone does it for a reason. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I really can't remember. Yeah. <laughs> and it's mostly because they don't know rather than yeah. anything. Yeah. It's, it's mostly just genuine ignorance um, of these things. Yeah. So what aspect of genealogy do you like the most? So like looking at records, looking at photos, hearing stories, that kind of thing. I love the detective search of it all. The, you know, today somebody phoned me and asked me to pick up on some previous research for her um, and build on it. And even though I was in the middle of trying to do some college work, I actually started working on it immediately because of the, the excitement of, oh, looking for something new that, you know, wouldn't be in any way difficult for me. I mean, it might it might well be difficult. The surname is quite a common name. But I mean, in the mm -hmm. sense that, like, um, I didn't have to consult any books to do it. I just go straight on to irishgenealogy.e and, and stick in the, 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 the person who she was talking about. The starting point would have been born in the 1900s decade. So I knew that there was going to be quite a lot that I could start with online and um, before without even having to move from my chair. So I love the the thrill of the the chase and and, and one of the, the problems when you're a professional genealogist and you love that is to to stop when you are stop being paid. You know, if someone agrees that you're going to do, for example, five hours of work, it's very hard to stop yourself at five hours if you think there's going to be more to find. You're just like, I'll just just do another 20 minutes for yeah. free. It's, so, a, it's uh, a little bit battle if you say you're going to do it for 20 minutes and then you get hooked in on oh, a yeah, I know. home that you're yeah. not back now. <laughs> but you have to learn to be disciplined when, when you're being paid for it, you know, and, uh, you know, go back to the client and say, OK, I've done the amount of hours we've agreed. And I really think, actually, that there's there's more to find here. Um, and, and, and there isn't a, there isn't a, a standard number of hours that you can say this will definitely cover it. Because sometimes, you know, you, you you do X number of hours and go, yeah, I think I've got everything there because I'm not, you know, they just haven't left a lot of paper behind them, particularly if people were landless laborers with common names. Um, you know, you might not get terribly far, but then you'll get the, the, the unexpected ones where I, I had one once where I had done quite a number of hours for someone and I was just coming to the end of it and I was, I was just double checking one thing and it, it led me down a rabbit hole that ended up in another several hours of research because I discovered something unexpected in England. And I had to do then research over there for her. She turned out to have English ancestors as well. And it, it led off, you know, unexpectedly. So the the, the thrill of the, the chase, the detective work of it is, is what really gets me. I mean, I love putting it all together, of course, and, you know, showing it to people and, um, giving them information that they didn't have about their own family is, is exciting particularly when you've managed to find a photograph of an ancestor that they didn't have you know that they weren't aware of and you can say not only have i found this cool ancestor for you but here is a photograph that somebody who's distantly related to you stuck an ancestry 
um and you know you can now look at it too which is wonderful you know to to see to see their face when they get that sort of extra new information is brilliant mm. and like i do i can relate to you on the thrill of the chase because uh earlier on i had a run-in with my notorious great uh grandfather or no great great grandfather and i was trying to f and i had oh he was confusing because I found a death cert for, Anthony Carney was his name, and I found a death cert for a 1903 uh, dead, and he, was, and he was supposedly still alive in 1911, and I thought, oh, what's going on here? So I had to do a bit more looking, and uh, then I came across it, and on the, inf on the informant column it said Catherine Carney, daughter, which is correct, he did have a daughter named Catherine. Okay. And I looked at the 1911 census and I found him living, but uh, I couldn't find him in the 1901 census for whatever reason. And weirdly enough, the um, the wife listed herself down as widow on the 1901 census, and yet she's married in 1911. And it's the right household. They're the same place. Uh, Could he have a uh, cousin who was the, had the same name as him? <laughs> and this is the thing. I looked in 1901 census and there was another Anthony Carney living with his wife and another and had a daughter named Catherine. There you go. And yeah. that and that was the Anthony that I had found in the 19 of in a nineteen oh three death search. And then it kind of thought, okay, well if he isn't here, then where is he? Because none of the other results are showing up for me fit the criteria and they were nowhere near close they were like in the 1950s at the age of 80 something so not right. anywhere near what i was looking for i was looking for probably a 70 or 80 year old man in the 1911 or 20s um so i went looking i was kind of thinking right what other districts could i look at because uh one of them that did actually show up in my family history more than once but not very not very common was Castle Bar, and I think what I I, I think I found him uh, in 1914 at the age of 60 something, um, which corroborates kind of near enough mm -hmm. roughly yeah. with what he was in the census, but obviously. You can't rely on the census age for yeah. the exact age of the person. No, you can't. No, <laughs> I would say there what what you'd be better off doing is is not putting in a registration district, um, but just being aware of uh, it's it's Mayo obviously. So just being aware of all the registration districts that there are in Mayo, and so you hmm. get you return the list for the whole country, say of Anthony Carney deaths, um, in that period, go a twenty year period, say, and then look one by one at each registration district that is Mayo until you whittle it down. Mm. Uh, I actually have, see this behind me, I actually have this list on my wall. It is the full list of all registration districts by county. Because I don't have, I, I, I don't keep them in my head, <laughs> you know. And some of them are, the, the problem with the registration district county is that it's not the county, it's not simply going, okay, show me Mayo. But Mayo is a registration district within Mayo. So, you know, it's a very common misconception that, you know, someone goes to that Irish genealogy site, which is a great, great free site. And, that, you know, I can't believe how much money I haven't given um, the department of whatever they are at the moment uh, in them giving away all of that stuff for free is wonderful. Um, mm -hmm. When you just have to pay four euro a go and wait for it to come, you know, in, by email or even in the post, um, if you couldn't get into the reading room, there's, there's so much information on it, but, the, the, you know, I think that they could manage it a little bit better in the way that they display the information for people because people aren't automatically going to know the registration district system that we have in Ireland. And like it, it, Cork's a really prime example. Like, you know, people might go, oh, came from Cork, stick in Cork. Oh, I can't find the person in Cork. I don't know what's going on there. And then there are like nine other registration districts for Cork, you know, so th that they wouldn't necessarily know to look under. Um, mm. So I always, I actually, unless I'm really, really sure of the registration district, I don't put in the registration district when I start a search there. Yeah. Like for me, this is on my father's side of the family. But um, typically it was, 
Swinford or nowhere. <laughs> Uh, but that was my problem. I always had so like, the tunnel vision, the kind of thing. It's always Winford, always Winford, always Winford. It's not like Castle Bar or any other mm -hmm. district. It was always Swinford, and in this case, mm -hmm. it wasn't. Uh, yeah. well, so that's, that's a good another... lesson for you. That, that you know, and and you know, someone who maybe has moved because they're old and infirm, and they had to go and live with a family member. They could have un not unknowingly moved over a border. For into a different SRD, and that doesn't matter to them in day to day life, but you know, it might make a difference for the record searcher. Yeah. So, what now, if you feel comfortable sharing this, what's an interesting story or event that you've discovered about your ancestors? Well, it was, I had, had to think about this one now quite a bit because, you know, we're giving away the trade secrets now that I knew that you were going to ask me this question. But, <laughs> um, you know, um, I, I thought I'd tell you a story about one of my ancestors um, who was slightly famous in that he was the mayor of Limerick. Um, but this this story is from before he was the mayor of Limerick. He was a river pilot um, working on the Shannon. And to become a river pilot, you had to apprentice at sea. You had to do five years at sea before you could become an apprentice river pilot. Um, so when he was quite a young man, he went off to sea um, to do his five years. And in the five years, he was shipwrecked four times. Yeah. Um, so it's really lucky I'm here. <laughs> in one, and and he, because he later on became a, a prominent politician in Limerick, um, stuff has been written about him and people have been able to research and, and people asked him questions. And so we know for a fact that that he was shipwrecked these four times. In fact, there was another shipwreck when he was older, which was not when he was at sea anymore, which I'll tell you about in a minute. But these these four shipwrecks were in different places and he traveled the world on ships in the in this time frame. But on one occasion, the shipwreck happened in the North Atlantic and the crew were clinging to pieces of wood in the sea for several days before they were rescued. So it's astonishing that, that he would survive. I wonder if he had the God complex because he survived so many shipwrecks, I don't know. Um, wow. But it may be, and maybe the, the the experience of that gave him the confidence to go into politics. I don't know. He was like, well, if I could survive that, I could survive anything. So I might still be um, Yeah. It would, um, kind of instill, yeah it, it would kind of instill some kind of confidence in you if you kind of survive that many times out of sea. Yeah. Uh, so he first, think, oh, he first became an alderman in uh, Limerick Corporation, as it was called then. Michael Joyce was his name. And then later on, he became the mayor of Limerick for two years running and then he was also an MP for Limerick so what he was an MP while he was the mayor um which uh nowadays you wouldn't do those two things at the same time um but uh but he did and so he used to go every week over to uh, the House of Commons and uh during the the parliamentary sessions and that was how he ended up on his last shipwreck which was in 1918 he was on the RMS Leinster when it was sunk by a German torpedo so it was a mail boat going between Dunleary and Hollyhead and a, a German U-boat torpedoed it. And um, it is the largest maritime disaster that ever happened in Irish waters um, with the largest uh, with in the largest loss of life in the Irish Sea as well. Um, and uh, Michael Joyce survived that um, and he actually ended up uh, helping to steer a lifeboat. And he was 67 when this last shipwreck of his life happened um, wow. and because he was an MP and um, he was interviewed in the newspaper after this event now obviously this was massive massive news you know uh, in the war that, that this mail boat civilian boat had been torpedoed and um, books have been written about why and so on but he was interviewed so for us as his family it's wonderful that we have his own words his own telling mm. of what happened in that experience and but he actually said that because he had this sea experience previously when the torpedo hit the ship he knew exactly what had happened immediately he you know his his previous um seafaring experience told him this is going to be bad and get the life jacket on and and of course they only had life jackets properly because of the titanic that you know after the titanic they changed a lot of maritime laws to make sure that there were enough life jackets on boats and there were enough lifeboats on ships and so on so he got into yeah. a, 
a lifeboat and they were they're they're only in the lifeboat for a couple of hours because they actually weren't very far out from Dunleary when this happened and and various uh, naval vessels and and smaller vessels came out to, to help because the explosion was heard from from Dunleary and so he got he got uh, he got back um safely uh, thankfully and uh, and then gave this quite big interview in the newspaper to the I think it was the Limerick leader the next day so we have a full account from him of what happened um with that last shipwreck of his life and I think that must have um must have made him reevaluate everything because he was supposed to run in the there was to be an election just a couple of months after this boat uh, was sunk and uh, he was going to run in it and then the the tide was beginning to turn against the home rule party which he was a member of and Sinn Féin were beginning to become into ascendance and and um, the way i've seen it written is that he was advised to step aside for the Sinn Féin candidate um, um, but I think that maybe he had just decided enough is enough. I'm 67. I've just survived the fifth shipwreck of my life. I'd really like to just relax for a while. Um, and so he didn't run in that 1918 election. And uh, so that was the end of his parliamentary career. Um, uh, but he lived till 1940. Like he, he lived a very long life, actually, for, for someone who was born just after the famine. Um, he lived to be uh, almost 90. Um, so he's an interesting ancestor to have and he he I suppose you might call him a gateway ancestor into sort of becoming interested in your family tree because of course we always yeah. knew about this man like he wasn't someone who we forgot about in the family and my he was so he was my grandmother's grandfather and she knew him like she she um she knew him reasonably well and she was she was um she was 20 when he died so she you know she knew him throughout yeah her life it wasn't like he died when she was four and you know she didn't really have any memories of him like you know she she did so she and she was very proud of him as well so um you know he was definitely a gateway ancestor into into becoming interested in in the family tree but I mean you know since then like I've I've had loads of become you know the way you have pet ancestors some of them you like more than others and some of them you know nothing at all about and um it was something I was saying on Twitter the other day to Blaine Bettinger is that, that I think the further back you go, like the, you're less emotionally involved with the ancestors, you, you know, uh, part of it is because you can't necessarily find anything about them, but also it's because the link to them is so removed. Like, you know, if I say someone is my, my grandmother's grandfather, that doesn't feel like it's that far away, even though he's a great, great grandfather of mine. And um, I still feel like, well, he's, he's sort of in living memory still, you know, hmm. As, uh, uh, some of his grandchildren would, are still alive, um, and uh, you know, so you can you can you can link into people that way. But once you go back a couple more generations, it's a little bit harder. You're kind of like, oh, what can I, you know, find out about these people? You know, it, it's very hard to bring them to life, hmm. particularly with Irish records, where we we very rarely get beyond 1800 with our with our ancestors in Ireland. Yeah, and uh, that is a good way of putting it, a gateway ancestor, because, you know, with my mum's side, there were some already interesting people, like my mum's grandfather, who she knew until he passed in 1986, at the age of 96, I know, that's a, that part, yeah, I know, his, he was one of five, and the eldest was 97. Um, 98 or no 97 uh and then it was him and then 89 and then 88 and then 20 he died of uh, tuberculosis or something at 20 uh but yeah that is that part was quite a uh, long with uh anyway uh so he uh this great grandfather of mine he was a um commander in the ira and oh. Yeah, and to and his father-in-law was, uh, if you've heard of Fratter Field in Dungarvan, it's kind of it's a hurling ground which is still used today, mm -hmm. and and he had purchased this land probably then eighteen, probably in the early nineteen hundreds maybe, or actually nineteen tens. I think it was nineteen tens later in life, uh, but uh, it was a hurling ground that he it was. 
basically a field that he bought yeah. and that was basically a way of people being able to practice Gaelic sports yeah. uh, because obviously it wasn't really going to be practiced many other places but this is a it was only really they, getting going at that point though I mean if you think about the GAA it was only founded in the 1880s and and it took a while for it to become the, yeah. the dominant sport that it is today um, and and it was a way as well I mean I'm not surprised to hear that somebody who was involved in the IRA was involved in hurling because the the although sport um wasn't necessarily linked to um the the rise of of the independence movement there it was kind of like a training ground like they would recruit people from the GAA they would recruit them from the Gaelic League you know because it was seen that if if someone was interested in these these re the revival of the language the revival of these sports that they might also be interested in um the political struggle as well yeah and um I found a funny thing from a cousin on Facebook that she had found in the newspaper. And it was this great grandfather of mine, his father. Uh, it was so like a quote from his father just kind of saying, oh, just give them the keys or something, because his house was being constantly raided. So he was just like, right, I'll just give you the keys so that you can just walk right in then. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, that that was kind of funny, but I do think so. Like, if you had kind of an ancestor that was quite interesting, it will kind of boost the like for family history more. Like, it will some definitely. People, yeah. If you have kind of like farming ancestors or something, it may kind of you may not have a big, huge, not so much love, but just kind of it might take a yeah. bit more for that spark to turn to a flame. Yeah. Uh, and then you realize, oh, this is actually quite interesting, even though they're only farmers or ag labs or servants or something. Yeah, yeah. So um, is there a particular record that you like most? Yeah, um, I really like the prison records, actually, um, because um, you get quite a lot of information about someone on a prison record. Um, you know, you usually get a description of what they look like, um, eye color, hair color, height, type of complexion, and uh, sometimes you get their weight. Um, you get uh, usually get where they're from, and maybe if it's different, where they're living now, and you get a next of kin usually, and then you get all these exciting details about their crime as well, <laughs> um, which you know. What do they do to be in prison and of course sometimes it's terrible things and and a lot of the time it's a crime of poverty you know it's it's they've stolen a loaf of bread or you know uh you know so it, sometimes it's a little bit sad when you see people in prison for these mm. really insignificant things that today you would not be imprisoned for and and then you do also find people there's there's someone who is a brother of my great 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 grandfather and took me a really really long time to prove that he was his brother but he's in the prison records and um he um he actually was in prison for like a quite significant thing he um he assaulted his wife and child with a gun and um, now he didn't shoot them i think he maybe they don't they don't give a lot of detail but i i, I think he threatened them with the gun and then maybe hit one of them over the head or something and um, so i mean he totally deserved to be in prison for that and why <laughs> you might ask did i desperately want this man to be in my family i don't know but um you know it, it just it gave so much information about him like it, you know as i say a physical description of him and where did he come from and what was his crime and incidentally he only spent six months in prison for that terrible crime um, and then he got out and he's never heard of again that that's the last record of him but but like the prison records give you so much detail about people mm. and and it gives you right down the social strata as well so some records you're only going to find rich people who have land some records you're you're you know only going to find men in um and um, but the prison records you find everybody in which is great yeah as long as they were criminals. Uh, oh sorry delay just as long as they were criminals if, if people were completely lily white you're never going to find them in the prison records but in my experience i have found many people in my family in the prison records for just the most insignificant things like i found a great grandfather of mine in prison for having been drunk out on the street which it, it was a crime to be drunk in public can you imagine if that was a crime now um 
And so if you were unluckily caught, say you were walking home from the pub drunk and you were caught by the police, you could be locked up for the night just because you were drunk. So uh, in, th in that particular ancestor's case, that's what happened to him, I think. Um, he's, and he's let out, it's just overnight, but there's still a record that he was in prison for one night for being yeah. drunk. Um, or, the, you know, somebody else in a brawl with somebody, you know, and, they, and they're they're in the record. Him and, and the next guy, they're clearly, you know, together assaulting each other, you know, the record states. Um, so that's just two guys having a fight, probably drunk. Um, and they're in prison for a couple of days because of that. So the records are really, they can be really petty and they can be really detailed. So that, that's why I love the prison yeah. records. Going back to my the father-in-law, my great grandfather, um, he was actually imprisoned twice in his life. Once in Waterford. Now he's he was based in Dargarvan in Waterford, um, and he was, <laughs> and I kid you not, imprisoned for two weeks. I think after coming home from a um, coming back from a GAA conference in Dublin, and apparently so like causing a bit of a not so much uproar, but just kind of, I think the phrase is to like breaking the justice of the peace or something, or something breaking, along the line. Breach, breaching the peace, yeah. That's it, sorry, not breaking. Uh, and uh, I was kind of thinking, oh God, this is actually him, because I was actually reading the details. So like I had my ancestry tree on my phone or something, and I was looking at it here, and I was thinking, Oh no! <laughs> it was just the feeling of oh, I finally found one of them, and they have finally done something wrong. So that was, I think, about two weeks to a month. I can't remember the exact length of time. And the second time he was imprisoned for, I think, two years, up in Ballykinlar Prison in County Down. Right, but that's internment after in, in, after the War of Independence. Uh, for, and the. All I could find in newspapers, because I couldn't find any prison record for it, uh, was, quote, an ordeal from which he never recovered. But have you looked at, have you gotten his military records from the military archives? I'm still trying to find them. <laughs> right, but just contact them. Yeah. Because they have, they, they should have information on that for you. And I would think that an ancestor like that might even have a witness statement from the, in the Bureau of Military History. Um, so, I know my great grandfather did. I know he definitely, like the cousin that I was saying on Facebook, she did actually have this and she passed it on to me. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was interesting just reading it, and my mom and I were just sitting down reading it, and we and we just both found it like an interesting read, even though it was like twenty something pages. It was still interesting. That's quite a small one. I, I, I had somebody that I did some research for. He was quite an elderly man, and he told me that his father was in the GPO in 1916. I thought, oh great, so many people think they were in the GPO in 1916, and um, but it turns out in this case that this man's father was in the GPO in 1916, and his file in the military archive was 164 pages. Um, and he'd, he'd had a pension and there were letters of proof because you actually got more of a pension if you could prove that you were in the GPO in, in Easter <laughs> week of 1916. So he had like two letters from, from other people going, yes, I remember that I saw this guy in the GPO that week. Um, so like there, there was loads of proof of it in that particular instance. Well, um and, and and he had a really interesting file and, and i mean i i think it's just nothing but wonderful when we get this information on people that you know we wouldn't have had otherwise um but that's why i'm saying that you need to investigate whether this other ancestor of yours had records because if he was interned in valley kindler then then he probably did something to generate that you know they i mean they did just round people up but almost certainly it will have generated paperwork um that can be still accessed in the military archives and they're very oh. responsive by email. You you have to prove your descent from the person. So like I was able to oh, get my no great problem. grandfather. Yeah, wait, exactly. No problem. You just you just give them a pile of birth, death, and marriage records, and and then they send it back to you by email. I mean, they have them all scanned. So it, it you should be getting on that tomorrow, I would think. Yeah, yeah. I see. I'm not writing my. Irish essay or something. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately, I think that has to come first. 
darn. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I'll get back on track. So, what does genealogy mean to you? Um, I think it's fairly clear that it's my passion. Um, it's a, uh, you know, I've made it my job, something that was my hobby and my interest. I've made into my job. Um, so it's it's pretty big for me, you know. I I can I can bore absolutely anybody you ask me to with genealogy information, um, and uh, you know. But I couldn't be happier about it, you know. <laughs> isn't it great to have? Is it, it you know? It, I kind of remind myself of you know when you when you read um, interviews with actors and they go, oh my God, I can't believe someone pays me to pretend to be someone. I can't believe that that's my job. I feel a little bit about that about genealogy. It's like you want me to. You're gonna pay me to do this. I would do this for free. I'm not gonna tell you that, but you know, it's it's so interesting to me. It doesn't even matter that it's not my own family history. I'll just work on yours. That's fine. Um, oh yeah, no, I'm the same. I do it with my friends as well, uh, and yeah, one friend of mine, I uh, actually found. I was helping. I was helping him look for stuff on his. It was like his second cousin, three times removed or something. But we were just basically going up as far as we can. And when we've done that, we go by layer and then go down and down and down and then back up on the next layer. Um, yeah. And we came and we came across one. One was, and he had the most interesting occupations, these two. One of them was a barrister uh, with a very successful career and had ties to James Joyce. Right. Uh, and people. Uh, and the other one was used to be or had been once upon a time the secretary to the Archbishop of Dublin, <laughs> oh, right. and then and then actually joined a uh, priesthood himself, and became Monsignor, or I think it was that I think it was that title. Uh, now, Monsignor, but, is, Monsignor is the rank above parish priest. Yeah, and uh, uh, and they had one of them was named, and the barrister's name was Constantine. And we were looking for like a common name in the area. And I was kind of saying to him, oh, just start here and I'll start on here. So we were certain two lots of things at once. And uh, he just said, oh my God, I've got the one wacky name on this list. <laughs> and I told, and he totally wasn't rubbing it in, just kind of rubbing it in, kind of going, I've got a Constantine and you got Johns and me. <laughs> Well, that's brilliant. Like when you've got a mad name like that, it's going to pop right out of the records for you. Oh yeah, it, it, and it was so easy. Although yeah. death, death, so you couldn't find. He died after nineteen seventy, so um, okay. um, you couldn't find that. But uh, Burton, almost, uh, with someone who was a prominent barrister, would almost certainly have an obituary in the newspaper, so you could just go I into mean, the newspapers and and look for his death then. In that, yeah, and I think actually he found his death on. UCD website or something. It was on a college website, and it was um, uh, and that data corroborated with a find a grave entry. Right. Okay. Uh, so that helped. <laughs> yeah, I'd still uh, want to be ordering a death certificate to go with that. To, you know, I, to, yeah. to finally iron it out. You know, and um, but you know, it, it, when you've got a really unusual name like that and and an occupation like that, the the you know, the chances of there being someone oh, else to match was, would be really, really thin. Yeah. It was finding this Constantine in his family, it was so, it was much easier than finding my, you know, Johns and Marys with the most common yeah. most names in those areas. This is like, I'd rather that than <laughs> what I have to find. Uh, but uh, no, I totally don't uh, miss uh, looking for any Johns all the time. Yeah. I totally love them. Uh, <laughs> so um, I'm almost, for anyone watching, I'm almost done with my questions. So um, if anyone has any questions for Claire on anything in genealogy, do ask them now because uh, uh, you mightn't get an opportunity for another while. Uh, <laughs> so get them in while they're hot. Uh, so what advice would you give to a young person starting out in genealogy? Um, you definitely want to find people who are going to help you. Um, you know, you want to um, start out by asking the people in your family everything that you can think of. 
And I always think a really good way to do that is to have a photograph of people's wedding. You know, the big photograph of all the guests at the wedding and pull that out and say to them, OK, who's this? Who's this? Who's that? And eventually you're going to get the story, you know, like, well, that is Uncle Nigel who had the wooden leg. You know, he'd be like, oh, I want to know that story. Um, definitely spend time doing that before you go on to any internet sites. Um, and I would really caution against putting a tree online as a beginner, because uh, if you do and you follow the little leafy hints on Ancestry, you might get uh, led down the wrong path um, before you really understand how to um, interrogate those hints. Um, because sometimes they look right and sometimes particularly if they're from other people's trees for example um, you, you don't know how how vigilant someone was in verifying the information that they've put in their tree so I would say don't put anything online for a while until you've you know had a good handle on all the free records that are out there and talk to everyone in the family who's older than you for information um, and I would also say that it is worthwhile doing something that's a little bit more old school, like getting involved in a family history society or a local history society that's in your area or that's in the area that you're interested in. Um, and you mentioned at the start that I'm involved with the IGRS, um, which is, we think we're the oldest Irish genealogy society in the world. At least no one is, no one is challenging us for that title. Um, <laughs> founded in 1936. And when I was getting involved in genealogy as a, not a, not as a hobbyist, but like when I started to pick it up more seriously, I got involved at the IGRS as a way to meet people in the community and get to know them. And um, but what you, what you get when you join something like that is that you get to tap into all the experience and the advice of people who've been doing this for a long time. Now, sometimes that means you have to listen to quite long winded stories about how back in the day they had to do this on a microfilm in a you know in a room that had no windows um in dublin castle or something and but that's okay you know um things were different in the past um but you know the, the you can't underestimate the the knowledge of people who've been doing this longer than you uh, mm. in, in your shortcuts or maybe maybe they'll say to you actually you are doing that the most efficient way already it's just a cumbersome thing to do um, yeah but so there's lots of good um ways to tap into people helping you and i'd like the ancestry hour is a more modern version of that i mean we're not a we're not a society on ancestry hour but you could say that we are a community of people who are willing to help other people um so the idrs you know at the moment it, you know they're very limited in what they can do in person but they're doing online lectures they have you know a website where people can pose questions and so on and um i, I also am involved with the boards.ie forum for genealogy um, which uh, again is a place where people, it's a more old school style of uh, social media, a, a message board, but um, someone can come on and go, hey, I'm looking for information on how to do this and other people will respond to them and advice. And there's a lot of quid pro quo in genealogy. Someone will say, oh, I don't have access to the Irish newspaper archive. And someone else will say, hey, I do. I'll look up the thing that you want to find. You know, obviously not totally speculative searches, but if someone, say for example, you're a barrister there, you know, easy to look up in the 1970s and see when he died for someone and then and give them the death notice and then they're keyed into where they go next for that information yeah. um so definitely you want to find people who are going to help you out um along the way uh, and and build up everything that you know from your own family before you start relying on internet sources yeah and um obviously with um times are changing and uh, more and more young people getting in uh, to genealogy do you think in your own opinion there is kind of like a suf not so much sufficient but so like there is some kind of outlet for them to you know connect with pe people their own age and do genealogy you know i don't think that we've done particularly well with that in ireland uh, i would like to see a younger younger base um, and I mean, I used to joke that I was the only person under 40 in, in our city <laughs> and sadly I'm not under 40 anymore, but, um, you know, the, but we have to have, we have to have people coming up who are younger. Otherwise, um, there won't be people to take over, you know, when, uh, when we start to lose people at the other end. 
Mm. So you know, you have to foster younger people's interest, and you know, and maybe that means trying to talk to university societies like history society in the various universities and saying, oh, do you have a branch that deals with genealogy? Or maybe it's it's people like you and, and finding other people like you and getting them interested in, in, in secondary school. Like transition year would be a prime time to get people interested, mm. I think. And I tried in my local school to suggest to them that we might run a couple of classes and they, they were like, no, we're not bothered. And I thought it was such a shame. But it is also a bit difficult. Um, and, and, and one thing you have to consider is that there's lots of young Irish people now whose ancestry isn't Irish. We've loads of people who've come from other yeah. countries and were born here or came here as very young children. And maybe their ancestors are in Nigeria or China or Poland, you know, or Lithuania. And um, it, it is a little bit more challenging to say, well, this is Irish genealogy, but you people over there would be left out by this because yeah. they aren't in Ireland. So you have to be very aware that we're becoming more of a multicultural nation and and to support that where we can. Um, but I still think there's room there's room for both. And, and and if that means that your your Lithuanian classmate goes off and researches how to look at uh, USSR records to find her ancestors, great. You know, yeah. there's room for that too. So um, we can definitely do more. You can always do more to encourage young people to be interested in this. And, and it does have, a genealogy does have a bit of a rep as being, you know, an older person's hobby. It's up there with gardening. Yeah. And, um, why are they all beginning with G? I don't know um but it you know we can we can do better with that and it's just you know like i have a little niece and i i i already tell her stories about the family tree you know they're very mm -hmm. limited stories at this point but i want her to be interested so that that there's someone to to take over you know so you, you always want to be you always want to be encouraging new people to be interested in the hobby yeah and that that's very true because obviously like you said and is becoming more multicultural and diverse with uh cultural backgrounds and everything else uh every day it's not just oh each month it changes or no it's every day like different thing like it changes so much and it's changed quite a lot obviously in more recent times uh and it's only a good thing but it just means that we have to revise how we might have done a project like encouraging younger people into genealogy yeah. then, you know when, then when i was when i was 17 you know it would have been quite different the way we would have done it mm. definitely so with uh obviously i've seen it recently pop up in my twitter feed you probably have as well but kind of uh the petition started by the cigo yes CIGO, uh, yeah uh is obviously on its last thousand uh so, I think so what it is is let me give you a little bit of background so CIGO stands for the council of irish genealogical organizations and it's an umbrella group for lobbying the government about things that are relevant for genealogy and so in the past CIGO has been uh instrumental in getting the um the births, deaths and marriages records, the way we record the information on those records was changed um, about 15 years ago. And a part of that was to include more information on, on our death records. So now when you register a death, you have to put down the person's uh, birth surname, you have to put down the names of their parents, where their parents were born. And, and those that information wasn't on death certificates up in, in, in the last century. And Sego was one of the organizations that was instrumental in getting that changed. So CIGO mm. has been running a campaign for quite a long time now to try and get the 1926 census released early. And there's a lot of reasons why we would do that. And, and most notably is that we have a gap from 1911 to 1926, yeah. 50 years where we didn't. In 1921, instead of having a census in Ireland, we decided to have a civil war. Um, and I think we could have done both, uh, you know, just fill out the form and then pop out with, with the gun in the basket. It, it could have been done. <laughs> And and it wasn't. He was very remiss of them, and they weren't thinking about the future. And uh, so yeah, they left yeah. in 1926 when we had independence. So a lot happened in that 15 year period. You've got the this not just the the independence, but we also have the First World War. Um, when and it was also a period of great migration in Ireland, where lots of people moved, and lots of lots of Protestants were forced out, unfortunately, and they went away. So the 1926 census is going to give us a lot of really inter interesting information when we get it and yeah. there is officially a hundred year seal on the census which means that it can't be released until 2026 
um, the, the year that it happened didn't ha doesn't have to be complete, as I understand it. So it's not 2027, it can be 2026. Yeah. Um, and previous governments had given a commitment that they would release this material early, but then never did anything about it. Yeah. So the reason we have a petition is to, to try and raise awareness with the idea that we would go and try and meet with uh, the relevant minister, who's Catherine Martin um, in the Department of uh, Heritage, uh, to, to get them to start working on it. Because um, the 1911 and the 1901 censuses, which were also released early, there is precedent for this, um, were already microfilmed um, when we put them online. They were, they were microfilmed in the 1960s and made available to the public, and then they put them online in the in, the, in 2009 onwards. So, but 1926 is still a vast quantity of boxes of paper. Yeah. So they have to start from the scratch there. And um, if they were going to do anything like redact uh, people who might be still alive, um, that you know, work needs to be done. So they need to get going on getting this work started because it's not going to be a quick job. No. Um, so part of the reason we have the petition is to try and just sort of raise awareness and at, we're asking people to sign it um, so that, you know, we can go to the, the department and say, well, look at all these people who are interested in seeing this information. And, you know, OK, maybe maybe there isn't time to get it released early at this stage. You know, this it's five mm -hmm. years. You know, maybe it, it we won't know until we start how long it's going to take exactly. to get this you know, into a format where we suddenly can go live on the census website and drop down and now there's 1926 after 1911. And, you know, that's what we want. We want to be able to compare them and, and see what we can get out of that information. Um, so we're trying to raise awareness for it and that's what the petition is there for. And um, I mean, it will come eventually, but what we don't yeah. want to happen is that it, it becomes publicly accessible, you know, because a hundred years have passed and they've done nothing to get it publicly accessible. So it is de facto accessible, but in fact, there's no way to get at it because they haven't cataloged it or put it in any sort of order yet. And, and it's not available. Um, so the sooner the better they start uh, working on it. And, um, you know, maybe those are the ways, maybe they'll explore it. Like in America, they usually release the records to a company like Ancestor. They have a, a tendering system and then they release the images and then Ancestry does all the indexing and transcribing. Um, I would imagine that our National Archives is one, going to prefer to do this work um, by tender and then make it available for free like they've done with the other censuses. So, so that process needs to be dealt with as well. Yeah. So, yeah, that's the plan is that we're going to get them to, to work on it. Um, and, and, you know, maybe that means we have to go and help them. I don't know. But, um, you know, we, we want to encourage them. Yeah, 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 so many people would help. Um, so we just want to we want to show them how many people want this information available to them and, and then get them used to the idea that from now on there will be a new census um, every so often for them to release. Because because we had this great loss of our census records, there hasn't been a, a, a history of them having to release census records in Ireland. So after 1926, mm -hmm. 1936, 1946, and then after that, they go to every five years, which people always forget in Ireland that we do the census every five years. But not this year. We've cancelled it because of COVID. We're doing it next year instead. But they're doing the census in Northern Ireland and in the UK, they're, they're doing a census this yes, year. Yes, I've seen that all over Twitter. <laughs> yes. But ours is being postponed. We postponed it once before in, in 2001. We postponed it because of the foot and mouth um, outbreak. Um, and uh, we did it in 2002. But they always go back to the schedule of it being on the one year and the six year. So we'll do one in 2022, but then we'll also do one in 2026. Hmm. Fair enough. Now, there's loads, more, there's loads, loads more exciting census material to come, hopefully. <laughs> yes, I know. Now I just have to live long enough to see it. <laughs> That's the only Absolutely. problem now. Yeah. That has so, to be the aim, doesn't it? As a genealogist, you want to live to see yourself on the census. Yes. I have to live to be 102. I think it's achievable. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, trying to, I'm trying to think how... how it so won't be so bad you, for you because it won't be so bad for you because then um, it's been every five years. So, hmm. yeah, I'm trying to think because if it's 2000 every five years, so I probably have to be 103. 
Okay, right. Well, you've got a long wait. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. And if anyone watching here hasn't signed this petition and wants to help in any way they can, and please do share it if you haven't already, I will link it in this post, which I will do after I end this broadcast. And for anyone watching on Instagram, I'm going to have to do this little layout now. Uh, for anyone watching on Instagram watching this, um, the link will be on my profile in the bio fairly near the top uh so with that i think i shall end so thank you claire for coming on and uh being patient with me uh with my little <laughs> mishap <during it. laughs> uh i th i think everyone this the audience that are what you know, uh, enjoyed it so uh i think i may do this uh on facebook in future so without that i shall end now so see you all next week bye by the way <laughs>